Welcome to episode 57 of Fascinating, a Star Trek podcast. The Enterprise Incident. In this week's episode, concerns are raised when an erratic Kirk leads the Enterprise into Romulan space, apparently in violation of the peace treaty in place between the Federation and the Romulan Star Empire. Soon surrounded by enemy ships, Kirk and Spock must face off against a wily commander, but can they outsmart her, or will their ship fall into Romulan hands? Well, you look like the devil himself, but as long as you're alive, what's it all about? Good evening, Ian. What is it all about? It's hard to say, really. The devil's involved in some way. Did you enjoy the return of the Romulans in this week's episode? I did. Now, I was led to believe that season three was a bit of a, a shit show for Star Trek, but I think it's uh, this proves everyone wrong. Yeah, right up there. I'd say this episode is my top five. Yeah, that was a great episode. Brilliant, yeah. Very much enjoyed it. Did you enjoy the, the principal villain? I did, and I recognised her, so no doubt we will discuss her at the end of the, the episode. Yeah, I'll keep folk on tenterhooks until then. Mm. It was good, there was a bit of tension as well, a bit of sexual tension, which we will chat through in great detail. Yeah, she was quite randy. V very. Not just her? No. I've got questions about that, which hopefully you can answer. Well, hopefully. Mm. I also liked the dramatic score, the motifs in this episode, I thought they created tension and um, urgency very well. Yeah, I've got a note about that. I thought the music was superb for this episode. It was good. Usual guy? There's not, there's not really a usual guy, is there? Don't know. Should, you should have looked into this if you wanted to discuss it. Oh, <laughs> you should have. You should have had the trivia. You're the, as you've told us all before, the internet's leading expert in all things Star Trek. I think that's easily disprovable. Well, yes, yeah, I'm not talking about the original series. Of course. Anyway. Shall we get on with the, the episode in a very unusual opening? Let's crack on. What is unusual about it? Doc Log. It is. 5027.3. Yes, McCoy is recording because he is concerned about Captain Kirk. Yeah, he's showing signs of stress. We've had this a few times, haven't we? It's not the only time we've had this, yeah. Then, onto the bridge. We immediately see that this is demonstrated when Kirk rudely dismisses Chekhov's work and then snaps at Spock and the rest of the bridge crew. Yeah, McCoy continues his log, saying he finds no reason for the captain's behaviour other than the fact they've been on patrol too long without relief and diversion. That reminds everybody of obsession. Yes. And there's a little bit of this in the conscience of the king as well for Kirk, where he gets this sort of single-mindedness. Yeah, he's refused to be evaluated, hasn't he? It's not just obsession, is it, as well? There's the one with the sort of space amoeba. Oh yeah, that one. Space amoeba. What was it called? You'll remember. Of course I do, but I'm not telling you. Let's move on. <laughs> they get more concerned when Kirk orders a reluctant Sulu to change course and head where? into the neutral zone and mm. then through the neutral zone they do so and later spock is relieved to report there are no vessels in their vicinity at that present time and sulu reports they're yeah now entering where romulan space ah, no, that's even that's even worse in the neutral zone absolutely we remember though the last time they went into the neutral zone they were immediately surrounded so they've, they've got by a wee bit longer this time yeah a puzzled Scotty, he enters onto the bridge. Yeah, he starts uh, whispering off at the back of the classroom. Yeah, to Ahura. He wants to know when Starfleet ordered them into Romulan space and she's not aware of any such order, leaving him incredulous. And Kirk again, a bit snappy. Well, he's fed up with him whispering up the back. Yeah, tells him to bring any complaints into the open before we see what. A ship appears on the screen and Scotty immediately identifies it as a Klingon vessel. But Spock notes that his intelligence shows that it's not a Klingon vessel, it is in fact a Romulan ship. Yeah, we can talk more about that at the end of the show. Can we? Okay. Uh, yeah, apparently they are now using Klingon designs. Which they maybe obtained by subterfuge. Did they? Being sneaky people. 
All right. Or the production crew thought, oh, we'll just reuse that. Well, like I say, we'll discuss <laughs> that later on. Kirk orders a red alert and Spock reports a second and then a third ship approaching. They are surrounded and we get a zoom in on Kirk's dramatic music plays. And then the credits. So back to the bridge. Kirk leaps into action and tells Ahura to inform Starfleet of the situation before demanding to know from Spock why his sensors had previously read it to be all clear. Yes, when these ships were clearly nearby. He starts to give his theory but they are interrupted by a video message from the Romulans. You have been identified as the Starship Enterprise. Captain James T. Kirk, last known to be in command. Your information is correct. This is Captain Kirk. I am Subcommander Tal of the Romulan fleet. Your ship is surrounded, Captain. You will surrender immediately or we will destroy you. They want something. Or they would have destroyed us by now. True, Captain. That would be standard Romulan procedure. It's my ship they want, and very badly. It would be a great prize. Save your threats. If you board this ship, I'll blow it up. You'll gain nothing. Who is that beside you? My first officer, Commander Spock. Vulcan. Yes, Commander. Yes, Commander. No one should decide quickly to die, Captain. We give you one of your hours. If you do not surrender your ship at the end of that time, your destruction is certain. We will be open to communication should you wish it. You understand that Starfleet Command has been advised of the situation. A subspace message will take three weeks to read Starfleet. The decision is yours, Captain. One hour. So I have a question here. They have entered into the, the Romulan zone, the Ro Romulan space. But Kirk threatens there, or reminds Tal that the Federation know, but is Tal not within their rights to destroy a ship that enters their zone? Well, yeah, but he doesn't want to start a war, maybe. Well, he didn't start the war. Well, true, but he maybe wants to de-escalate okay. rather than get into a war. It just depends. I like the fact, and we see this a few times in this episode, that when the Romulans talk to each other. We only hear one end of the conversation. <laughs> yeah. They're using um, earbuds. Sure. We're now in the briefing room. We are in the briefing room and Spock explains that the Romulans have developed what he calls a cloaking device rendering the Enterprise's tracking sensors useless. That's, that's his excuse. <laughs> <laughs> it's no <laughs> my fault. Spock, They're invisible. Exactly. Spock, <laughs> why did you not pick those up? Cloaking device, Captain. Yeah, it's impossible. Nobody could have seen them. <laughs> Kirk notes the potentially severe consequences of this technology and he has a dig at Scotty when he admits that they were certainly caught out. Yeah, he yeah, comes in like Captain Obvious and then uh, when he's then asked for a sensible contribution he has nothing. No. In any case, Kirk claims they have three options. Yeah, they could fight and lose, they could blow themselves up or they could surrender. Not great. Option three is obviously the one that you have to go for here. You think? Scotty reckons that if they lose the Enterprise intact, it could be catastrophic in terms of the information available to the Romulans. So Spock then takes a different angle. Well, I think Spock and McCoy, they turn on Kirk for putting them in this position where they had to make such decisions. Yeah, McCoy is shocked to learn that Kirk didn't have authorization to enter Romulan space, so Kirk kicks him out. Yeah, he dismisses him for this uh, perceived insolence before having uh, a stare down with Spock that is broken when Ahura communicates through with a, another video call from the Romulans. Yeah, the Romulans have come on Zoom and want to take it in the briefing room. Tal tells them that his commander wants to see him and Spock on board their vessel and they offer to exchange two officers with them to, I suppose, act as hostages whilst they are away. Yeah, and Tal acts incredulous when Kirk suggests he doesn't maybe trust them because they're the ones that have invaded Romulan space. <laughs> so what's the solution they come up with? Simultaneous exchange. I'm not even sure that would, you know, if you don't trust them, yeah. how do you know? It's like three, two, one, go. You didn't uh, press the button. Yeah, but Kirk, I think, is quite happy to go ahead anyway. So we're in the transporter room and before leaving, 
he gives orders to Scotty to fight the Romulans if they do not return and to destroy themselves if necessary. I think uh, Scotty must be saying, yeah, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll definitely do that. Yeah, no, yeah for sure. No worries. Yeah. I Kill myself, yeah. Kill myself. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, no problem. If you don't come back, we won't run away. Well, we well you're safe on the airship. Yep, we'll fight. We'll kill ourselves. Yeah, no problem. Sure, Captain. He's thinking, no chance. We, I enjoyed this moment, actually, the next part. So Kirk and Spock beam out and two Romulans arrive and as soon as they appear, they pull their weapons out. <laughs> 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 Scotty is irritated by this quite clearly. You can see the expression on his face. Understandably. So we find ourselves in the commander's quarters. How would you describe the commander's outfit? Encouraging. <laughs> Immodest. It certainly is. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't displeased. I mean, she's, a, she's not a, the, the youngest of um, the female guest stars we've seen, but she pulls it off, I think. Well, obviously she's reached the rank of commander, so she can't be that young. But oh. she certainly is young enough to get away with this short skirted uniform, the thigh high boots. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, she's not unattractive. At all. She's well presented. And so, of course, Kirk is not unhappy to lay his eyes upon her. And I think he tries a bit of his uh, well known smooth talking. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. This is the first time we've seen a, a female Romulan of such high rank. She's presented in a very different way to the, the male commanders. Is it the first time we've seen any female in. Well, we had a commander. Ah, we did, yes. Played who, by uh, Spock's dad. Yeah, and, and also. Um, when the uh, what was the one with the gas monster yeah the one with the uh, zephram cochran that's it yeah anyway who she, was, she wasn't presented that way though what way that she wasn't half dressed no i'm saying that she was a senior figure yeah but this one is half dressed for some reason that's the way romulan's role mm, apparently so you get a brief exchange of pleasantries and spock is asked to wait outside while kirk and the commander discuss matters we kind of skipped over early on. The Romulans were surprised to see a Vulcan on the Enterprise. Tal expressed a little bit of surprise when he yes. saw him. Yeah. It's quite relevant. So, where were we? Okay. Kirk lies and tells her that they, uh, there was an instrument failure. Yes, they were across the neutral zone before they realised it and then surrounded before they could head home. She doesn't buy this and rightly accuses him of espionage. He insists they weren't spying and both raise their voices at each other before she asks what he thinks a starbase commander would do if the roles were reversed. I think that's quite a nice approach as well. It's a good point. Well made. Mm -hmm. She then asks Spock to return. Yeah, and I think is this the point where she notes her surprise at finding a, a Vulcan on board the Enterprise? She does, yes, at this point. And Spock says there's no way that she should have known because Starfleet don't send out their rosters to the Romulan. <laughs> she accepts this, but admits to having an interest in Spock as... He is a Vulcan and apparently Vulcans share the same origins as Romulans and I think she refers to them as distant brothers. We must have discussed this before in a, the previous Romulan yeah, I mean, episode. At this point they haven't fully fleshed out the relationship but the the story goes that Romulans are Vulcans who left the planet back in the ancient times after rejecting the ways of logic. Oh, bad Vulcans. Yeah. Okay. She asks if it is true that Vulcans are incapable of lying and... He confirms it's not a myth. So, if they were capable of lying, he could be lying. Yeah. And if they're not capable of lying, then he has to, no matter what, it's he also, can give this answer safely. Uh, it's, we've also seen it's complete nonsense. Spock's lied many times and... Yeah, and he's lying now. Yeah, I mean, he's dressed up as Nazis and things and, you know, it's not. It's showing that the Romulans aren't fully on top of the Vulcan culture, I think, and Vulcan ways. But she uses this logic to ask him what they're up to. He, however, states that it is not a lie to keep the truth to oneself uh, and declines to comment. It's self-incrimination. <laughs> Pleading the Fifth Amendment. Yeah. But we see Kirk react to this and the commander leaps on this apparent admission that there is some unspoken shenanigans going on. Yes, and despite Kirk's exhortation, she's adamant that they are spies with an interest in her cloaking device. Yeah, she admits that while they can't force a Vulcan to speak, humans are a, another matter. Spock claims that it would be ineffective against Kirk. I'm not so sure about that. Well. Uh, she shrugs, saying, uh, too bad, he will be dead or suffer a, a, fate, a fate worse than death. And at this point, Spock makes a move that enrages his captain. I cannot allow the captain to be further destroyed. 
The strain of command has worn heavily upon him. He has not been himself for several weeks. That's a lie! As you can see, Captain Kirk is a highly sensitive and emotional person. I believe he has lost the capacity for rational decision. Shut up, Spock! I'm betraying no secrets. The commander's suspicion that Starfleet ordered the Enterprise into the neutral zone is unacceptable. Our rapid capture demonstrates its foolhardiness. You filthy liar! I am speaking the truth. For the benefit of the Enterprise and the Federation, I say now, and for the record, that Captain Kirk ordered the Enterprise across the neutral zone on his own initiative and his craving for glory. I kill you! Not the same. I kill you. I kill you. <laughs> Why he started to talk like that? I don't know. He's just he's at breaking point because he's so desperate to have the glory and the power. So obviously you're sitting there watching it, going, "Yeah, this is a setup." It seems that way. Mm. Spock would never turn on Kirk in this way. No. Unless he's been seduced. He's not been seduced yet, has he? By the glories of the Romulan Star Empire. Mm. On the bridge, the commander lets the Enterprise crew know that they are being charged with espionage based on the testimony from Spock. But it was Kirk's decision. And so, fortunately, only he will be held responsible. Yeah, the crew will be released back to the Federation once they've been taken to a, a Romulan base for processing. Yes, but Kirk is going to be held. An angry Scotty orders the two Romulans to be sent to the brig and gets a communication channel to the Romulan ship. He does, he says that she can't tell him what to do, they're going nowhere and the only orders they'll follow are Kirk's. Yeah, and if they try and board the Enterprise what will happen? It will explode. This seems like what the Romulans are quite happy to do. Really. No, they want the Enterprise. Yeah, they do, but I'm sure that that's the second prize would be them blowing the ship up. Yeah, and they keep Kirk. And they keep Kirk, yeah. Because obviously the uh, Enterprise must be quite a... It's the, the flagship of, their, of, of the enemy. Yeah, I think capturing it would be very much preferable though. Of course, yeah. Speaking of Kirk, he continues to rage against Spock and the commander has him dragged off in the direction of a holding cell before turning to Spock and asking how he tolerates living amongst humans. Yeah. I think she also notes her dismay at seeing a, a Vulcan working with this uh, this race. Yes, he explains though that he is himself half human and this um, forces her to ask where his allegiance lies. And she starts to drive this wedge between him and Kirkor. She's trying to by stating he is a, a subordinate to his orders and his whims and she asks why he's not in command of his own ship as he is the superior being. Yeah, he says he's been a Starfleet officer for 18 years and he has no desire for a ship of his own. And she at this point essentially asks him if he's rationalising a discriminatory process that excludes him, a Vulcan, from leadership. Mm -hmm. And proceeds to make an offer that he admits to that, that would tempt him. Yeah, well, she says to him that the Federation's not the whole universe, and he says he has himself thought that way sometimes. Yeah, all he has to do is to bring the Enterprise back to the Romulans. So he flips this around and says, yeah, it's you that wants the ship, you want the Enterprise, it's not me. But she says, of course, it would be a great achievement to obtain it, and it would broaden the scope of her powers and open opportunities for him if he were alongside her. Why would she assume that she can flip him so easily? Well, maybe she thinks that he couldn't possibly be enjoying but being she a knows nothing. human ship. Yeah, see, it doesn't ring true. She doesn't know anything about him. He has been there for 18 years. And well, she thinks that with one, you know, a couple of sentences, ah, you should have your own ship, he will, he will flip. Well, she probably believes that he's being um, kept down by the Federation as a superior creature. He mm. should be in charge. And she maybe thinks that she can tap into this. Yeah, I suppose. But Based might... on her sort of flawed knowledge of the Vulcans. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we're down in the cell. Kirk is thrown in and is knocked out by the force field around the door when he tries to escape. Well, I don't know if she's trying to escape, he's just testing the force field, running at the force field it's randomly. Stupid. <laughs> I think she would think, I'll just yeah. test this gun. 
I'll, I'll just see. shoot myself in the head. Yeah, I'll try this electric fence. It's like uh, when you go to, I don't know if it's just me, but whenever in a, in a restaurant, the, the waiter puts down a plate and goes, be careful with that, it's very warm. The oh, first thing you just it. touch it and go, oh yeah, yeah. right, it's warm. Good warn you. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Kirk appears to be unconscious, so over on the Enterprise we get McCoy receiving a call from Uhura requesting that he attend to Kirk's injuries on the Romulan ship. Back to the cell. McCoy's there now. He scans Kirk, who twitches a little, and McCoy says he'll need further attention and the commander should be informed. Yeah, so the guard does as he's told, and out in the corridor, Spock joins the commander on her way to see Kirk, where she tells him that he's to join her at dinner. Yes, he's not particularly uh, appreciative of the way that she phrases that. No, so she rephrases it. I think it was it came across more of an order than a request. Yeah, she makes it a, a question, and he says he would be honoured and asks whether these two goons behind him are also invited. Yeah. However, he is warned of going down a, a specific corridor to a, a red guarded door. Now, where, where was he going? He was following her to Kirk's. Yeah, he just he saw this door and just decided to go and have a look. Knock him back here. He can't just wander around. And he's, I think, trying to suss out where the cloaking device is. Yeah, it's a bit of a long shot, isn't it? He just... Anyway, he's told, yeah, that, that corridor is just for the loyal Romulans and hopefully one day we won't need to restrict you. <laughs> in the cell, they enter to find Kirk sitting up but in a daze as McCoy agrees that he is not fully competent and this could have affected his earlier decision to cross the neutral zone. The commander at this point turns to Spock and notes that he is now in line to captain the Enterprise and he agrees and says he is ready. Which causes McCoy to rage at him. Yeah, but Spock shuts him down and says it's misguided loyalty to resist any further. Yeah, he should stick to saving lives and uh, tells him the safety of the crew is now his main concern, not who's in command. Kirk rouses at this, calling Spock a traitor and saying once again that he will kill him before lunging feebly at the Vulcan. <laughs> yes, which apparently causes the unprepared Spock to instinctively use a Vulcan death grip. Yes, this causes Kirk to fall backwards, his face contorted in pain. And McCoy confirms the worst. Yes, Spock says it was very surprising and this death grip was used instinctively, unfortunately, effectively, and Kirk is now dead. End of episode. Credits. Yep. Sick bay. Chapel comes in to find Kirk lying under a machine and screams when he suddenly opens his eyes and she calls for McCoy. Yeah, he's annoyed that she's there at all because he'd given orders for nobody to come through, but now that she knows he's alive, she might as well help him out. Yeah, he's not surprised. He discovered that Spock only gave him a, a nerve pinch, as both he and Kirk were acting under Federation orders. McCoy presumably has surmised this rather than been told it by anybody. Yeah. He's brought round and he's obviously groggy. He tells them his neck feels like it's been twisted off, and they mention the fact that there is no such thing as a, a Vulcan death grip. I thought there was. Nope, it's just pop culture for you. From this episode. Yeah. We've never heard before though that the death grip or the nerve pinch simulates death. No. It just knocks folk out. Yeah, and I thought he had to do it around the back of the, the neck. Well he did, he did that. Did he? With thought... his left hand, ah. while he was the right hand in Spock's in right. Kirk's face. Okay. McCoy points out that he was lucky the Romulans didn't start an autopsy, which is a good point. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Before more of their plan is revealed in that they still have to keep up the pretense to the rest of the ship that he's dead. Yep. As the whole point is what? It's to keep the, the ship, the crew and the Federation off the hook if anything goes wrong. This is very sort of CIA, isn't it? Undercover ops where the government... It's a rogue agent. Yeah, and yeah. if anything goes wrong they deny any knowledge. Yeah, a bit like 24. Jack Bauer, you, go, okay. you can kill whoever you want but we're not taking the blame. Sure. Never watched it. Oh, yeah, it's like that but it's in real time. 24 hours? 24 episodes. One hour per episode. What about ads? They're included as part of the hour. So the clock ticks and then the ads start and it comes back and it's like... So how long was each later. episode? An hour including ads. Alright. Oh, so it's actually less than an hour then? No, because time passes during the ads. Oh, does it? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So like you right. come up to the ad and it ticks up to 45 minutes and then when it comes back it's 48 minutes. I've never watched it. I, I mean, I quite like um, Keith or Sutherland and... It looks like it might be quite fun, but also... It's get, quite right-wing. Yes, and a bit jingoistic, so it's always sort of put me off. Yeah. A bit late for it now, anyway. Well, no. It's about 20 years old, isn't it? Yeah, maybe 15. Mm. 
I just got my parents into watching The Sopranos. <laughs> I've not watched that yet. Neither have I, but they're looking for something and uh, they've rattled through. I think they're on season six now. I think I went to The Wire. Yeah. It's meant to be the best thing. Mm. Roman. Or Mad Men, that's my favourite. They've watched that. Yeah, I got, uh, they watched, I've not watched that. Justify, that's one of my favourites. I've not seen that. That's good. Mm. But it's got a... A cowboy feel to it and you're not a big fan of the westerns. Don't like the, they don't like the westerns, don't like the black and whites, don't like the <laughs> uh, pirates. So, yeah, okay. It's not those things. Anyway, we're on the bridge. McCoy communicates with Scotty and tells him to come down, but she eventually agrees to do after McCoy insists it's of the utmost this, this importance. Scotty's been a complete arse here. Yes, like, well, come on. It can't uh, be that important. It really is. Come down. No, yeah. no, no. It can't be that important. Come down now. Ah, uh, well, it better be important. So Scotty then storms into Stickby, Stickby? Into Sickby and stops, delighted to see Kirk being alive. We heard at the top of the show that he does look a bit devilish now. Yeah. Kirk then tells Scotty he needs a, a Romulan uniform and he leaves to sort it out. Well, you've kind of skipped over the lead there. I do. Kirk's been surgically altered to look Romulan. At the end of the previous scene, he's told Bones to prepare for surgery and McCoy doesn't know why. Yeah, and now we ah, come right. back and he's I... Yeah, I don't think I, pre uh, I fully appreciated that. I thought maybe it was just makeup and proth prosthetics. Yeah, he's yeah. surgically altered. Yeah. Well, you're at it. Uh, <laughs> no, right. Yeah. Kirk um, implies also this uniform that he wants should be taken from one of the prisoners. Yes. He says, do you still have them in detention? Ah, they're copied, I guess, but mm. I like the idea that they just take it off him. He's left on his pants. <laughs> maybe they give him a robe. <laughs> Something. Give him one of a Hura's <laughs> uniforms, wear that if you want. Yeah. <laughs> or a, a house coat and a cigar. Back to the commander's quarters. It's uh, dinner time. It is, yes. And she continues with her attempted seduction of Spock with food and a test tube of blue drink. Yes, he says he's very flattered and the cuisine exceeds that available on the Enterprise and is a very powerful recruiting inducement. It's like he's out for a job interview. He's like, yeah, I, I am willing to consider your company. <laughs> But please provide me more drinks. Maybe an orange one. Back to the transporter room. Scotty and McCoy are with Kirk and don't know what is holding Spock up. But Scotty does confirm that they have a clear channel with him. So Kirk takes a chance and decides to beam down onto the ship or across without the specific coordinates. Yeah, the Romulans don't seem able to detect this despite their technology. And he appears in a corridor just in time before a, another guy comes around the corner. Yeah, and he has to bluff his way out of the situation by claiming he has important information for Tal. Yeah, he's just escaped from the Federation ship and he needs to know where Tal is. And he's told, Control Central. Control, Alt, Delete. He praises this officer for his good work and tells him to return to his duty, which the very pleased and happy looking guy says, Oh, yeah, I've done a good job, I'm off. Hopeless. Sacked. Back to the commander's quarters. Spot we never find out her name, do we? Well, it gets mentioned in a minute. Yeah, we never find out. No, we don't. Spock's getting this orange liquid um, that I mentioned previously, and he continues to eat and is told by the commander there's nothing for him in Starfleet. He should take the place she has offered. Yes, and then he listens to her with her offer of a, well, a more intimate proposition. Our people are warriors often savage but we are also many other pleasant things I was not aware of that aspect of Romulan society as a Vulcan you would study it as a human you would find ways to appreciate it Romulan port with my flagship at its side. Yes, of course. But not just this moment. An hour from 
from now will do even better, will it not? Commander. Yes. Yes, it will. Mr. Spock. You do know I have a first name. I was beginning to wonder. Hear it? Yeah, well, there we go. An, an hour. Oh, uh, he's four times at least. And watch an episode of Star Trek. <laughs> and finish his food. <laughs> he calls her name rare and beautiful but incongruous when spoken by a soldier. And she leaves the room to transform from a soldier who doesn't wear much into a woman. Yeah, well, I've noted here that she gets up and leaves with her skirt around her arse. Yeah, to change into something more. Less revealing, less comfortable. Ah, who knows. As soon as she leaves though, Spock is on the phone to Kirk, explaining that he has the coordinates, but Kirk says he's already on board. Yeah, did you see, yeah so Spock says that he's, the cloaking device is near. Did you see that? No, he's about to say that after Kirk says he's already on board. Yeah, it's near the commander's quarters, but is closely guarded. While he asks Kirk for his current location, we see Tal being informed that there is an alien transmission originating on board. Tal is shocked and asks for confirmation and the location. Uh, back to the quarters. Kirk tells Spock he will get the cloaking device and asks if he can get back to the Enterprise. But before he can answer, the commander returns in more inappropriate attire, or appropriate depending on your position. Spock has to hang up quickly and say yes. It's not only more appropriate, it should actually stimulate their conversation. Yeah, this all is quite sensual and quite erotic here. The, uh, the, the, the touch hands whilst performing this Vulcan sign and he gives her ring a bit of a rub. He does, and I think we can all assume what happens next. Well, you know, this continues. This isn't a, like, Spock is not a, a two-minute man, is he? As we He's certainly doing a bit of setup. In the corridor, dressed in Romulan gear, Kirk knocks out a guard who is standing outside the device room. And we go back to to Spock and his uh, his new friend. They are now on to the lips and face in terms of touching. It's not clear how much time has passed. No. Spock makes her smell his fingers. He does something anyway. And they both admit to feeling... Emotional? Er erotically emotional, yes. She urges him not to question his feelings. But the doorbell goes. And it's Tal who's a cock block. He comes in and says that there was a transmission and it came from this room. And at this point, Spock walks over and reveals his communicator. Quite casually. Yep. Yeah, it was me. This was all, ha, I've just done that to you and it was all, uh, I don't really feel anything <laughs> about you, but I thought, well, I was here. Yes. She realises that they're after the cloaking device and sets off telling the guards to bring Spock with them. So at the device room, Kirk is in, well, he's inside, but again has to knock out a guard before approaching the glowing globe that appears to be what he is looking for. Yes, he takes it with the... Uh, I thought it was quite funny, he just lifts it up under his arm. Yeah, it looks like um, Sargon's globe. Mm -hmm, yes. With bits of Nomad sticking out of it. Yeah. And he lifts it up and tells Scotty to beam him up. Yeah, I think he also tells him he's got 15 minutes to hook it up to their system. Well, when he gets there, I think. Okay. And after he leaves, or he... he and after he beams up, the Romulans arrive to discover it missing and the commander instructs them to search all decks. But Spock is quite matter of fact, isn't he? He says that's not going to do you any good. Waste of time. The commander now turns on Spock, calls him mad and says, what is he that he could do this? And he says, hey, I'm first officer of the Enterprise. Yeah. Uh, she, she seems really, I mean, this, this is the thing. I assumed, okay, so we knew that he was playing her. Yeah, uh, he was. Uh, you know, he wasn't ever going to take out the offer up. It was all for the benefit of the uh, Federation. Yeah, I had assumed that she was doing the same thing, just trying to seduce him to get the Enterprise. But I get the feeling that there is between both of them there is a a, a mutual connection. Connection at mm -hmm. the very least, yes, a, a sexual connection. Probably that's a name for a, a good name for an eighties band. Everything's a good name for an eighties band. Sexual connection. In fact, I'm going to start yeah, one. Start in the one. 80s. Yeah. Spock asks her at this stage about their current form of execution. Yeah, I think he's quite resigned. He's done his duty. Yep. We got a quick captain's log. 5027.4. 
uh, they're trying to get this cloaking device installed, they hope it'll work and they hope that Spock can buy them enough time to make it work. On the bridge, the crew are delighted to see Kirk walk back on alive, even though he has weird ears. Yeah, Chekhov is ask, uh, asking about them and is told they'll discuss it later. Yeah, and tells them to head for home. He also wants Spock's readings pinpointed on the Romulan ship. Yep, and while they hang around, they're told it's not a request to get on it. Quite right. Back to the commander's quarters. She dismisses Tal and tells him the boarding of the Enterprise will begin on her command and to destroy it if there is any resistance. Yep, she then goes to talk to Spock about the terrible form of execution that they have, but he demands his right of statement. Yes, which will require no more than 20 minutes. That's quite a long statement. Yeah, it's like the Father Ted winner speech. And now I move on <laughs> to liars. Father. <laughs> she uh, she responds, yeah, that's that, that's fine. However, we, we will find his ally in less than the 20 minutes and he's going to die with him. Yes, he then begins to speak as she records him, saying that his crime is sabotage. He admits his guilt and talks about his oath and his he's just trying to buy time here isn't he yes yeah. nice. she interrupts and says this is uh, captain obvious stuff Spock yeah. and he's like I can say whatever I want it's my 20 minutes we quickly cut to engineering where we see Scotty working away before we return to Spock and his confession and he's still going and then we get over to Kirk on the bridge telling Chekhov to yeah. hurry up it's like the time in the, the Goonies when Chunks asked to tell him everything so like, everything yeah okay and he goes back to when he was at school and in the cinema making people sick and things yeah. like that and uh, Chekhov is lamenting the similarities in physiology between Vulcans and Romulans but eventually he does find Spock and the transporter room has sent the coordinates as Scotty calls him up from engineering. He's installed the device, doesn't know if it'll work. Kirk tells him to stand by as they beam Spock over. Yeah, she, as this happens, she notices what's going on and sort of grabs at him. Yes, and she is uh, transported with him and Uhura reports that this has happened, they've both arrived and Kurt says, send them up to the bridge and let's go, warp nine. Yeah, he's got a smile on his face. He doesn't he doesn't care that he's got a Romulan commander with him. And I think in fact I think he's quite pleased about it. Yeah, she can see the outcome here. Over in the Romulan ship, Tal is told that the Enterprise is running and he brings their weapons online. However, there is a problem as Scotty tells Kirk that the device isn't working as the commander arrives in the bridge to credit him with what he's achieved so far. But point out also that he will be dead quite shortly. Very shortly indeed. Kirk hails Tal on the screen and tells them, and is told by Tal that they cannot escape. Yeah, but Tal himself, he's surprised to discover that the, his commander is with. Yes, but she issues a direct order to destroy the Enterprise as Kirk cuts off the communication. In a panic, Kirk demands that Scotty throw the, throws the switch on the cloaking device, even though he has no idea what's going to happen. Yes, the, the Romulans are preparing their weapons and Kirk asks for the commander's forgiveness for fighting back, but she understands, she expected this to be... And I think we, we, in, a, in a moment, Michelle, we see there's a, I think there's a level of respect between both, you know, captain and, and commander. They know they're only doing their, their or yeah, performing their, their roles. Duty, yeah. Anyway, the switch is thrown and of course... It does work. Tal sees the Enterprise disappear and asks his team to use their course to work out where they are now and fire. But Kirk has Sulu come about and the weapons miss. He cancels red alert and they head off towards the nearest outpost unseen where he promises the commander he will drop her off even though she would rather be their prisoner. Yeah now Kirk sensing the relationship between Spock and the commander tells Spock to escort her to the uh, to the brig. And I think, again, she seems to appreciate this, this mark of respect. Yeah. So, in the turbo lift, and again alone, they have one final intimate interaction. It is regrettable that you were made an unwilling passenger. It was not intentional. All the Federation wanted was the cloaking device. The Federation. And what did you want? was my only interest when I boarded your vessel. And that's exactly all you came away with. You underestimate yourself, Commander. 
You realize that very soon we will learn to penetrate the cloaking device you stole. Obviously. Military secrets are the most fleeting of all. I hope that you and I exchanged something more permanent. choice. It was the only choice possible. You would not respect any other. It will be our secret. We then get a wee brief denouement on the bridge where Chekhov reports that they've crossed into the neutral zone and McCoy gets in touch to ask Kirk to come down for a, a quick bob of his ears. Is that a, a term when you do things to animals, is it? You bob? Bob ear, I don't know what Bob means. Bob hair, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I think it is. Spock encourages him, encourages him to go, noting that the ears do not look aesthetically agreeable on humans. And uh, McCoy repeats his request, asking if Kirk is coming or if he would rather spend the rest of his life looking like he's first officer. Yeah, when Kirk rushes off at this, I think Spock has, uh, first is happy, then thinks, well, wait a second. Hang on. <laughs> what are you saying? And then it's time for another adventure. It is. Um, the, Rom- the Romulans were the good guys in this episode. Well, certainly not the bad guys. Yeah, done nothing wrong as far as I can see. No, but in times of war, you need to act in certain ways. But are they? A, is it a time of war? I mean, well, it's, it's kind of a cold war. Yeah. yeah so they've developed something, and again, it's not specifically an aggressive device. It's a cloaking device. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've, you know, they've had the the, the, the the ingenuity. They have the the skills to advanced the technology yep and the federation has the skills to acquire it yeah. through this method it's a risky mission but they pulled it off the federation are obviously on the side of, of, of the enterprise there i mean are they as a federation what why would they want to deny what they were you know why would why is this a covert operation in case it doesn't work so and they have to say oh no we didn't authorize it we don't want a war let's everyone calm down yeah hmm. i think the romulans would i mean do the romulans think that the Enterprise just went rogue. No, it doesn't matter because they were successful, so now the Federation can say, yeah, we've got your technology, so... That could start a war. Yeah, there's no point in you fighting us, we've got cloaking devices. Mm. Bit, I feel sorry for the Romulans. They invented a great machine and the Federation just stole it. I don't know. In the future, which doesn't come up here, there'll be a treaty that prevents the Federation from using cloaking devices. Right. Are you satisfied with the, the resolution? Yeah. I don't think there was a problem with that. Do you think Spock had genuine feelings for the commander? Yes. I mentioned earlier, I think they both had feelings for each other. I suppose, although I'm saying that, I mean, the Ro- the Romulan commander is on a ship full of Romulans. Yeah. So she can get what she wants, whereas Spock is in a, a ship full of humans and maybe misses the intimacy with people of his, you know, the sort of Vulcan background. Yeah, maybe. Possibly. But Vulcans are only meant to be interested in that sort of thing once every seven years anyway. Right. When they go through their pump bar. Yeah. No, they were definitely in teach other and they definitely banged. You think they did in that yeah. two minutes in between Tal coming off the bridge? Well, I don't know, door? but she was, yeah. They are both at it. Was there one of the coloured drinks you thought was particularly appetising? No. Not the blue one? Nope. The blue drinks are for, for, for kids. Orange drink? Nah. Anything else you want to say about the episode? Other than that it was a really good one and season three is off to a decent start. It is off to a decent start. Um, last week's was fun, f- f- as we mentioned before, it's uh, regarded as being terrible but it was, it was alright. It was terrible but in a, in a good way. Yeah. This was a strong episode, a genuinely strong episode. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm quite positive about season three going forward. I'm waiting for the big dip and yeah. hopefully it won't come. Fingers crossed. Mm. Bit of trivia. 27th of September 1968, this episode first aired. It was directed by John Meredith Lucas. This was the second of his three goes in the director's chair. John Meredith Lucas sounds like a serial killer. Well, there you go. Maybe he is. You can learn more about him by going back to the podcast for The Changeling. Okay. Uh, Dorothy Fontana, who we talked about last week, is leaving the show as producer. She returned as the writer of this episode. Mm. So there's more about her. 
we've discussed her quite a lot in the past, but the most about her is in the podcast for tomorrow is yesterday in season one. Okay. Joanne Linville. Ah, no, I recognised her. She was the Romulan commander. This was her only Star Trek appearance, but she also showed up on other shows like Kojak, Mrs. Columbo, and Columbo. Yes, candidate for crime. Yes, she was Vicky Hayward. Nelson Hayward's wife. That makes her this week's connection. She is now 93 years old. Oh, is she? There you go. Jack Donner played Tal. He famously gave his name to the Donner Kebab. Yeah. He mm. didn't. That's of course not. not. I know it's not. This was his only Star Trek appearance, perhaps best known for his later film roles. In because we all know it was Richard Donner who yes. gave, yeah. Jack is perhaps best known for his later film roles in movies like Stigmata, Four Christmases and So This Is Love. But he also appeared in series like Charmed, Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Fear the Walking Dead. And he died in 2019 when he was 90. The trivia a cloaking device was, as we said, built from bits of Sargon and Nomad. The inspiration for the story was the contemporary capture of the USS Pueblo by North Korean forces during the Vietnam War. The Vulcan death grip, like we mentioned during the episode, not real, still a common pop culture reference. I think people use it to refer to the nerve pinch. Well, I think that's where I'm confused with as well. Before I started watching these episodes, I think I'd have heard of it, but yeah, I think there's just a confusion. Yeah. The Conflation. Ro- yeah, that's exactly right. The Romulans use Klingon designed ships, um, although there, we did see a Romulan ship in this one because it's been remastered and they put one in. Right. Uh, originally there was only Klingon ships. Ah. The reason for that is that the model for the Romulan ship from season one was returned to the guy who made it and he'd chucked it out by the time season three came around and the episode was written on the assumption that they would have access to that model and they did not. Hmm. Makes sense. In terms of international titles, in Germany this was the Unsichtbare Falle, the Invisible Trap. In French, Le Traitre, the Traitor. And our friends in Japan opted for Tomei Okosin, which means the transparent spaceship. <laughs> That's quite good. It's alright, yeah. Next week, it's the third episode of season three, The Paradise Syndrome, which features a pretty emotional punch. Oh, I hope it's not a pregnant woman again. Well, you'll have to wait and see. Okay. Oh, you're getting punched? Yeah. yeah. In the meantime, you can find us all over social media where we're at Trek Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can go to astartrekpodcast.com find a post for each and every episode or our YouTube channel where everything shows up once it gets past the sensors BDI. Until then, cheerio. Bye bye.